Nearly 30 years ago, John Lennon wrote the song, Imagine. And the lyrics went like this. Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. In other words, John Lennon was saying the world would be a much better place if we could get rid of religion and belief in God. Much of the source of evil in this world is due to religion. Much of the source of conflict in this world is due to religion and faith in God. And if we could eliminate this world of faith in God and religion, we would have a peaceful, unified world. Well, would the world be a better place if faith in God was eliminated? Many in the New Atheist Movement believe so. And the goal of this new group that aggressively seeks to rid the world of belief in God and replace it with reason and science, that is their agenda. And you may recognize some of these men. Their writings permeate our culture. They've been a powerful influence, especially on the public high school and university campuses. Three years ago, three out of these four men had published books that appeared on the best top ten bestsellers list for nearly two years. So if you went down to Barnes and Nobles and Borders, you'd see uh, their books in, uh, in the top 10 of uh, the bestsellers list. Their ideas permeate our culture and influence, especially our young people okay, who are seeking uh, whether their faith is true or not and what is truth. And our young people need to know there's credible reasons for faith in Christ. And here's some of the names you may recognize. Richard Dawkins, kind of the spokesman of this group, Oxford biology professor. Samuel Harris, Dan Barker, former evangelical pastor, now devout atheist, and, of course, Christopher Hitchens. And many of these men have written and their works appear on the bestsellers list there at Barnes and & Nobles and Borders. Well, can we answer the arguments from the new atheists, and how shall we meet the challenge? Well, first, let's take a look at their key arguments. Basically, when you read their literature, there's basically four key arguments that they present. That belief in God is irrational. If you want to be a Christian, you're going to have to jettison your brain okay, because all the evidence stacks up against Christianity. So the only way to be a believer in God and Christianity is by removing your rational thinking process, okay, to jettison your brain. Second, science has proven that God does not exist. All the evidence from the sciences go against the existence of God. Third, that belief in God is dangerous. The debate today has changed. Christianity is no longer one of many worldviews and philosophical ideas from which you can choose. If you look in the media today, Christianity is now considered pernicious and evil and dangerous, and it must be stomped out. And for those on the university campuses, whether it's directly stated or implied, that's the hostility you feel. And any good professor or public education uh, institution will seek to remove uh, narrow-minded, intolerant Christian thinking and replace it with secular humanism. In fact, if you saw in the recent elections around our country today, many of those running for office, a negative was what? They're committed Christians. Look at the attacks on people like Sarah Palin and others, uh, Duke Iona and others, uh, committed to faith in Christ or the Bible was a bad thing. How far our country has fallen hasn't it? You read our founding documents. You know, just read them. The Federalist Papers, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. What is the most quoted source in there by far? You know, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. You know, I was at a church recently here in Kaneohe and uh, 
uh, after service, they were arguing with me, saying the intent of the founding fathers was to get rid of religion from government. That was the whole point of the founding fathers, and that's what freedom is all about. And I said, "Ah, uh -uh, your freedom is based on the principles that come from the Bible. I said, you ever read the Declaration of Independence? Huh? You ever read it? You know, we are created, right, with inalienable rights, uh, created by our Creator, with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I said, Creator, creation, God-given uh, inalienable rights. I said, where in the world did that come from? Secular humanism? No, it came straight from the Bible. All right? Uh, so belief in God is dangerous. And fourth, religion is the result of a man-made natural evolutionary process. So those are the four arguments you're going to see throughout their writings. Well, can, are there intelligent answers to these challenges? Well, let's take a look at the first one. Belief in God is irrational. Sam Harris writes this. We have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they are likely to be called mad, psychotic, or delusional. Richard Dawkins states that belief in God is the result of delusional thinking. That's thus the name of his book, The God Delusion. He writes, faith is blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. In other words, these new atheists are saying there's no evidence to support the existence of God. In fact, the evidence, all the evidence goes against the existence of God. Therefore, belief in God is not built on sound reason or evidence. It's simply a blind leap of faith, a blind leap in the dark, despite the fact that all the evidence goes against you. Well, Christianity is a rational faith. There is good reason and compelling evidence for belief in God and in Jesus Christ. God is a rational God. He designed us as rational, reasoning, thinking beings. God never called us for a blind leap in the dark. He challenges us. Christianity has always been a religion of the heart and the mind as well. God says in Isaiah chapter 1, Come now, let us reason together. Biblical faith, as Ravi Zacharias so well put it, is putting faith or trust in where the evidence leads. And throughout the Bible, God, Jesus, and the apostles never wanted people to just take a blind leap of faith. From the very beginning of their preaching, they presented well-reasoned arguments and compelling evidence for faith in Christ. For example, look at Peter's first sermon there at Pentecost. What did he preach? Did he say, please, just believe me. Take my word for it. No. He presented a powerful apologetic message. He said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. He says, Jesus Christ did miracles which attest to his claim to be the divine Son of God. Here is the evidence which you folks know. You are witnesses of these things. And he goes on to say, he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament he thus is the Christ and the long-awaited Messiah. See, he wasn't asking for a blind leap in the dark. He was presenting good reason, compelling evidence for faith in Christ. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, this is one of the oldest creeds of the church. We can date this to about three years after the resurrection. It's one of the oldest creeds there. And what does Paul state? He states here, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. Here in the earliest creed, the earliest statement of faith, the apostles are presenting what? A 
powerful apologetic reasons and evidence for, for which you can put your faith in Jesus Christ, that Christ was a real person. He fulfilled the prophecies of Scripture. He lived a miraculous life. He died and rose again, and there are numerous witnesses for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Jesus and the apostles never asked for a blind leap of faith. God is a reasonable being. He's a rational being. He designed us in his image. And that's how we come to make decisions. Okay? Every day in life, we look at evidence, process it through our reasoning faculty, and come to our conclusion. That's how God designed us. Right? If you are going to uh, a hotel and there are two elevators, one has lights on, there's music, and you saw people coming in and out. The second one on the left, it's dark, there's no music, and you didn't see anyone going in and out. Which elevator are you going to take to the 30th floor? Well, it's quite obvious. How would you come to that decision? You looked at the evidence, you processed it through your reasoning faculty, and you came to your decision. You put your faith where the evidence was leading, all right? And you chose to step in to that elevator. Hey, if you've got your life savings, how do you decide what bank to put it in? There's one bank, it's got a 30-year great history, been around for a while, no scandals or anything. And another bank, just been around two, three years, all kinds of news of scandals there, rumors of it going bankrupt pretty soon. Where are you going to put your money? Well, how'd you decide? You looked at the evidence, processed it through your reasoning faculty, put your life savings there. Hey, that's how we're designed. We, and God knows that. We look at the evidence, process it through our reasoning faculties, and make our decision. Okay, if we do that in daily decisions, how much more when it comes to truth and our eternal destiny? Today, it's unfortunate that many Christians are unable to present compelling reasons for faith, but that's the message the early Christians preached. They gave sound reasons and compelling evidence for their faith. Christianity is not an irrational faith that requires one to jettison their brain in order to believe. Many scholarly men and women looking at the reasons and evidence have come to faith in Christ. You know, E.O. Wilson, one of the brilliant philosophers of our generation, man who read the arguments of C.S. Lewis and says these are, are intermediate uh, kinds of arguments not even worth my time uh, to refute. After looking at the evidence, eventually came to faith in Christ. Here's a man, Dr. Anthony Flew. He perhaps was one of the greatest atheist philosophers of our time. No one's come up with a new argument for atheism since David Hume, except for Anthony Flew. If you took Philosophy 101, you, probably, you may have read his works. If you're in apologetics, anyone in Christian apologetics, you had to answer his arguments. Hey, he is a titan amongst atheist philosophers. Hey, he's like the Billy Graham of atheist philosophers. Well, about 10 years before he died, when he died about two years ago, he came to belief in God. Okay? That's, that was a, a shock to the atheist world. That's like Billy Graham announcing he's converting to Islam. I mean, that's, that's how significant it is for this man to come to believe in God. How did he do it? Blind leap in the dark? No. He looked at the evidence, thought through it very carefully, and came to belief in God. There's three questions he was asking that he did not find adequate answers for in uh, Darwin's theory or in the naturalist worldview. It was, how did the laws of nature come to be? How do we get this ordered, designed universe like this, okay? where everything just fits in place for us to have life here? Number two, how did life come from non-life? And third, how did the universe come into existence? How does something come from nothing? Okay, the law of causality. Whatever has a beginning must have a cause. The universe has a beginning. We know that now. Therefore, the universe has a, must have a cause. Can't say it came from nothing. Okay? That's philosophically impossible and scientifically absurd. 
He wrote, Darwin saw that there was a problem with the origin of life. It is simply out of the question that the first living matter evolved out of dead matter and then developed into an extraordinary, complicated creature of which we have no examples. There must have been some intelligence. And he sent shockwaves through the atheist world. Of course, the atheists tried to throw him under the bus, you know, but he's just too big of a figure. We don't know if he ever came to faith in Christ, but he spoke very highly of Christianity. But whether he came to faith in Christ, we don't know. But we know for sure, before he died, uh, he came to belief in God. In fact, he wrote his last biography, which I got to interview the uh, author of that, who interviewed Dr. Flew. His final biography was, There is no, sl no slashed out, there is a God. Wonderful, wonderful biography of a man who lived by his model. Follow the evidence wherever it leads, even if it's to conclusions you do not like. And there was a man who was an atheist all his life, followed the compelling evidence for the existence of God, and came, changed his entire convictions and belief system to a belief in God. Christianity is not an irrational religion. In fact, in a debate I had with the Rational Response Squad, they were the number one atheist site a few years ago, famous, known for their, quote, blasphemy challenge. When they opened the debate, they said, now Patrick is going to open by saying faith. Despite all the evidence we throw at him to show God does not exist and Christianity is not true, he's going to respond by just saying faith, faith. It's all about faith. And they said, well, that's a poor argument, okay? Muslims can say that. New Agers can say that. Buddhists can say that. Hindus can say that. Patrick's going to have to present some compelling evidence, which he doesn't have. He's just going to say, faith, faith, faith. And uh, that's not a good argument. So when I opened, I said, thank you for clarifying that, because that's not biblical faith. Okay? That's fideism. Biblical faith is to put your trust in where the evidence leads. And there's good, compelling evidence and reasons for faith in Jesus Christ. So I want, you, I want to thank you guys for dispelling that false definition of faith. True biblical faith is putting your trust in where the evidence leads. Hey, they were really caught off guard. They never run across a Christian who could present good reason and evidence for faith in Jesus Christ. And God has created us that way. Hey, the heart does not commit to what the mind is not convinced of. If you go to a restaurant today, if you're not convinced that food is safe, you're not going to commit to eating it. All right? How much more when it comes to things of eternity? Okay? The heart will not commit to what the mind is not convinced of. We make decisions by examining the evidence, then use our reason to determine the most reasonable conclusion and action to take. We take a step of faith making a reasonable choice based on the evidence we have. Therefore, do not neglect the mind. Okay? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Christianity is not only a heart faith, it's one of the mind as well. Develop the skill okay, of answering challenges that come upon your faith, of presenting a compelling evidence for Christ. In our culture today, it's not enough just to present the gospel. Often you're going to have to present a compelling case why people should take your message seriously. The second argument here is that science has clearly demonstrated God does not exist. The new atheists allege that science and faith are at war and they can never be reconciled. In fact, a serious scientist or anyone seriously studying the facts of science would realize that everything we've discovered in the sciences goes against biblical teaching. Well, that's a myth. Okay? In um, Darwin's theory, there are some uh, clear flaws in that theory that show right now that theory uh, is a seriously flawed theory. I mean, there's a lack of transitional forms. Hey, the Cambrian explosion is an embarrassment. Hey, it, 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 uh, it's a dilemma uh, for the Darwinists. There's no proof that life came from non-life. There's no mechanism for macroevolutionary change. 
Mutations, natural selection, preserve a species. They don't transform and change a species into something else. And the classical arguments for the existence of God, for the resurrection, for the historical reliability of the Bible have not been answered. They have not been refuted. And in fact, what we're learning in the sciences today, the more and more we're learning in biology, microbiology, chemistry, physics, astrophysics, are all pointing to the existence of intelligent design and an intelligent designer. So much so, some of the top scientists in the world are acknowledging an intelligent designer. Fred Hoyle, and, and s several of these men are not Christian men, all right? Fred Hoyle, the British astrophysicist, author of the Steady State Theory, which was the dominant theory regarding the origin of the universe for many years, wrote this, a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology. Dr. Robert Griffiths, winner of the highest academic prize in mathematical science, writes this, if we need an atheist to debate, I go to the philosophy department. The physics department isn't much use. Dr. Robert Jastrow, NASA scientist, in his wonderful book, God and the Astronomers, and Dr. Robert Jastrow is an agnostic. Okay? He, uh, he's not a, a committed theist. He's one who says he doesn't know. But he writes this, For the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Here's one by Dr. Francis Collins, the leader of the Human Genome Project, a project funded by the United States government under Bill Clinton. Uh, millions of dollars were invested to map out the human gene sequence. And at a, uh, when his project was completed, he, he made this statement in a speech at the White House with the president by his side. And he records his journey in his book, The Language of God, from atheism to theism. He discovered uh, the DNA code is like a computer program. It's so precise, he concluded, it is one of the most powerful evidences for an intelligent designer. There's no way this could have come about just by chance or by accident. So here's perhaps the top scientists on, um, in, in genetic science saying this. Many will be puzzled by these sentiments, assuming that a rigorous scientist could not also be a believer in a transcendent God. This book aims at dispelling that notion by arguing that belief in God can be an entirely rational choice and that the principles of faith are in fact complementary with the principles of science. It's a happy day for the world. It is humbling and awe-inspiring for me that we caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book previously only known to God. So here's one of the top scientists in this area declaring uh, DNA is one of the most powerful evidences for an intelligent designer. A life application is this. Science and faith in God are not enemies. In fact, the more we are learning in the sciences affirm evidence of intelligent design. That's what the Bible states. Right? Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Night and day, they are pointing. Okay? Creation every day is pointing to a creator. You know, when uh, I was in high school, I had no interest in the sciences because they didn't make any sense to me. You know, how'd this come by chance and that come by chance and this come by chance? And it was quite depressing, too. You know, discover that I was from primordial soup. You know, that... I was simply an accident with no intention or design to be here. And the fact that the universe continues to expand and one day it's going to reach a state that's called final entropy, it's going to run out of energy, the universe is going to die. And as the universe, so mankind, mankind is going to die. The only sure hope we have is our extinction. That's the only sure hope we have. So what difference did it make that we were ever here 
What difference did it make? All the great things that I'm going to achieve in life, it ends in extinction anyway. What difference does it make of our men and women who give our lives on the battlefield for freedom when it's all going to end in extinction anyway? You know, ultimately, it's meaningless. And so I had no interest in the sciences. It, it's just kind of depressing, and, and I couldn't make sense of it. Well, when I came to faith in Christ, unfortunately, I was 18 years old. Um, well, fortunately, but uh, just unfortunately, it was after I was done with high school sciences. Um, when I came to faith in Christ, suddenly the sciences made a whole lot of sense. Suddenly now I realize, you know what? I am unraveling the mind of the Creator, discovering His design in every facet of the sciences. Okay? Suddenly science began to make sense. Suddenly I realized, Psalm 139, we are uh, beautifully and wonderfully made created for a purpose, created with reason, um, that the universe was created for us to discover and to enjoy. And the things I was discovering about creation was teaching me about the Creator. And so science and faith in God are not at odds. In fact, the more we are learning, it, it's beginning to complement our faith uh, and belief in an intelligent designer. And we cannot let this myth of the new atheism destroy the joy of studying the sciences and God's creation and how all that we study point us to our creator and it reveals his, the incredible mind and his wisdom behind the creation process. Third, belief in God is dangerous. Okay, you look through history in the world today, the cause of wars and conflicts is religion. Okay, specifically, Christianity. Okay, Christianity teaches there's only one way to God. Everyone else that goes against the teachings of the Bible is wrong. Right? It's religion which is uh, the cause of many conflicts in the world today. Richard Dawkins writes this. In fact, when you read many of the atheists who write and argue Christianity is dangerous, what we are discovering is really their lack of knowledge of the Bible. Okay? Really, they lack uh, a solid understanding of what is in the Bible. Richard Dawkins writes this in his book, The God Delusion. He states, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. A jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Well, this is... Clearly a misrepresentation of the God of the Bible. No Christian believes in this kind of God. And he's, Richard Dawkins is simply showing his uh, ignorance, really, of the Bible. Philosopher and theologian Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> said this in a statement recently, Radical Christianity is just as threatening as radical Islam in a country like America. Well, uh, once again, it shows her lack of understanding not only of Christianity, but all the world religions. All religions are not the same. They are not morally equivalent. There's a huge difference between the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of the Bible. There's a huge difference between the life of Muhammad and the life of Jesus Christ. For example, Okay. In Islam, there are two divisions. The house of Islam, that's all Muslims, and everybody else belongs to the house of war. What does the Quran teach as far as how to treat unbelievers? What does the Quran teach? Well, take a look, chapter 9 of the Quran. This is called the Surah of the Sword. Okay. How do you treat unbelievers? Fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them and seize them, beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem. Verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, 
nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his prophet, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are people of the book, Jews and Christians, okay, until they pay the tax with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, until they pay the heavy, heavy taxes and are willing to live as second-class citizens, fight them, okay, military conflict. What has history shown? Jihad is a military war. Okay. Chapter 8 of the Quran, I will instill terror into the hearts of unbelievers, smite you above their necks, and smite all their fingertips off them. This is because they contend against Allah and His Apostle. Allah is strict in punishment. Okay. If you want to see the ideal Muslim, who do you look at? Muhammad. Okay. The man to emulate by every Muslim is Muhammad. All right. What kind of man was Muhammad? Man was a warrior. Okay. Ibn Ishaq, in the earliest and most authoritative biography of Muhammad, records he fought in 30 wars. Before that, he made his living in Medina how? By attacking unarmed caravans, okay? taking their booty, selling their women and children off into slavery. All right? That's the example that we have. Okay? Um, uh, Muslims might say, well, he was fighting defensive battles. Read his biography. Okay? The Raid of Kabar. He writes in his biography, uh, the men of Kabar, that was a farming village. They didn't have any weapons over there. And he says, the men of Kabar came out with their buckets and shovels and we attacked them and slaughtered 90 of their men. Then he uh, thought that the leader of that town knew where gold was, so he tortured the man all day by burning coals on his chest until the man was near dead and then he chopped off his head. Then they went and sold us women and children, as they do, off into slavery, except the leader's wife. He saw that she was a beautiful woman, so he took her as one of his many wives. All right? <clears throat> In a, quote, defensive, defensive battle. You know? All right? That's the example of Islam. All right? What does the New Testament teach? Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. They are not morally equivalent. They're not teaching the exact same things here. How did Jesus say to uh, treat unbelievers and your enemies? You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Are not teaching the same things here. All right? And look at their examples. Okay? What did Muhammad teach? Fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them. What example did Christ set for us? Well, as he was dying on the cross, what did he say? God, get them. Kill them all. No, he said, Father, forgive them. All right? They're not teaching the same thing. Unfortunately, the press does what's called a terminology fallacy. Okay? They use the same term for all religions. What's that term? Fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Okay? When they talk about radical Muslims, they talk about Islamic fundamentalists. When they talk about Christians, they, talk, they call them what? Fundamentalists. And people think what? Same thing. Same thing. I was being interviewed by a newspaper reporter and of course we got to talk about Christianity and she said, I don't think religion is bad. What's bad is fundamentalism. People who take it seriously. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, hey, let, let's hang on here. I said, there's a big difference between an Islamic fundamentalist and a Christian fundamentalist. Okay, an Islamic fundamentalist wants to follow Muhammad's example to the T and he wants a strict interpretation of the Quran, which teaches what? Fight and slay the pagans, wherever you find them, on and on. I said, what's a Christian fundamentalist want to do? Well, they want to follow the teachings of Christ to a T. What did Christ say? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And follow his example, which was what? To die for those, even those who put him on the cross. I said, huge difference between the two. You cannot lump them together. And in fact, if we followed the teachings of Christ literally, if everyone in the world did, we'd have a pretty peaceful world, wouldn't we? Hmm. 
And in fact, it's not Christianity that's dangerous. Atheism is actually dangerous. You know, when I was at a church here in Hawaii, they were saying, well, the founding fathers wanted God out of government. That's what they wanted, God out of government. I said, oh, several uh, countries have tried that. It's called communism. How well did that work? Okay. Nietzsche, the man who said God is dead, said this, if you take God out of government, it, or you take God out of the culture, there will be blood in the streets. And sure enough, that is what has happened. This past century has been the bloodiest century in human history. These world leaders, influenced by Darwin and, ath and atheistic writings of Nietzsche, okay, implemented their philosophy of government. And what did we get? We got Nazi Germany, 12 million murdered by Hitler. Stalin and atheistic socialism, 18 million. Hey, what Stalin did makes what Hitler did, you know, look like a picnic. Mao Zedong in the 60s, the man who said, religion is the opium of the people, 30 million murdered there in China. This has been the bloodiest, bloodiest uh, century of, of human civilization. It's not Christianity that's dangerous. It's actually atheism that has proven to be dangerous. Okay. Our life application here, we must know our faith well enough to dispel these kinds of false myths that keep people from taking our message seriously. Paul says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that self sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, a lot of people who oppose Christianity, when you and I talk to them, you, en you end up realizing a lot of what they believe is they're attacking a straw man, a false misrepresentation or a false idea of Christianity. And our job, as Paul says, to know our faith so well, we can dispel, we can demolish, overturn these kinds of myths that keep people from hearing our message and taking it seriously. And finally, religion is the result of an evolutionary process. In other words, religion is a man-made thing created out of a need of mankind for some kind of father figure to give us comfort in a cruel and dark universe. Now, the new atheists, this is not a new argument, though. This is a very old argument presented in the 19th century by James Frazier in his book called The Golden Bow. And he simply said this, religion originates with man. Man kind of invented this. And the first form of religion is animism, okay, where they began to worship things in nature, right? the spirits and the trees and all these things. Uh, the Hawaiian religion is a good example of animistic religion. Then they started saying, well, the gods are, are in the sky, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars. And so it evolved into polytheism. And then they said, well, amongst all these gods, there's one who is the chief. Okay? So that's called henotheism. All right? And we just worship that guy, and all the others are kind of irrelevant or subservient to him. And from henotheism, it evolved into monotheism. That said, well, this chief God, he's the only God. All right? And they, they say that's how religion evolved. And as we continue and mankind grows up, we'll go from monotheism to atheism. Well, this is, once again, a theory that has no evidence behind it. In fact, all the evidence goes the opposite direction. Dr. Wilhelm Schmidt, and I've written a few articles on this, documented hundreds of cultures around the world, and he discovered, even in the most animistic cultures, before um, they began worshiping the spirits in nature, behind all of that is the worship of a heavenly father in cultures all over the world. For example, China. Before Taoism, Confucius, and Buddhism in the 5th century BC, what was before that? Oh, it's a belief in Shangdi, the heavenly father. What about Korea? Hananim, the Heavenly Father. Okay? In cultures all over the world, that's what they were discovering, and the stories were the same. All right? That originally the culture believed in a Heavenly Father, omniscient, omnipotent, a moral God who gave us a moral law code. Somehow the 
forefathers of those cultures angered the Heavenly Father. They lost contact with Him. They began worshiping lesser gods and eventually the spirits and nature itself. So the, uh, the pyramid is turned upside down. Monotheism was discovered to be the oldest of the religions. Animism and spiritism, the youngest, as cultures departed from faith in a heavenly father. That follows the pattern taught in Genesis and in Romans chapter 1 that says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animal reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. The evidence actually shows the reverse, that monotheism is the most ancient of all the religions. Well, how shall we respond to the new atheists and the challenges that they present? Well, the Bible teaches us that error, that truth does not run from error, but error runs from truth. We're not called to retreat behind our walls and try to ignore these folks and hope they go away. We would engage the ideas of our culture Okay, presenting powerful evidence for Christ, demolishing arguments that keep people from hearing the message of the gospel. Okay? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments. The Greek word for demolish there is kataskapto. Okay? He's drawing an image of attacking a fortified wall city. And first thing you've got to do when you get into the city, go down to the foundations and overturn those walls. All right? Uh, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We're called to engage those ideas and okay? dispel those myths that keep people from hearing our message. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason that you have, but to do this with gentleness and respect. Hey, remember, the heart does not commit to what the mind is not convinced of. We must demonstrate to all believers, okay, as well as unbelievers, there's powerful, compelling evidence and good reasons for faith in Christ. We're to love those who even challenge our faith, and loving them means to sit and listen to their arguments and respond with gentleness and respect but at the same time, remember, okay, as Jesus taught in Matthew 7, do not cast your pearls before swine. In other words, even our Savior understood. If they are not willing to get into an intelligent discussion, okay, move on. Okay? You don't have to argue with someone that doesn't want an uh, intelligent, reasoned discussion with you. Just move on until they're ready. And for any ministry in our post-Christian culture today that's going to be relevant, you've got to be able to do three things well. You've got to be able to proclaim truth okay, in a compelling, relevant manner. Number two, you've got to be able to defend that message you proclaim. And number three, you've got to be able to live out that message in a powerful, compelling way that's so different the world cannot ignore your message. The goal of the new atheists is to rid the world of faith in God. Yet the Bible continues to show itself to be true. More and more people continue to believe in God despite the attacks of the new atheists. The new atheists say that Christianity is irrational. That belief in God is irrational. Psalm 14.21 says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God when looking at all the evidence and the compelling reasons, perhaps it is the new atheists who are being irrational. With the highest hopes Where fullness flows Where the Spirit knows The way to go our paths Illuminated We know that we can Spirit knows the way to go we 
king of with the highest arms where the fullness flows where the spirit knows the way to go past illuminated we know
Yeah.